All right, we're back with more from the effect and thinking about isolating front door paths, right? We're trying to try and be able to identify the causal effect of X on Y, even though we can't necessarily measure and control for all the variables we need to control for, because we can find some source of exogenous or random-ish kind of variation, and then isolate that part of the treatment that is driven by that random variation, and it sort of acts like an experiment for us, allowing us to isolate just the front door paths. Now, uh, this is a very cool concept. It might allow us to run things that are sort of like experiments anywhere. Now, there are some limitations to it. We will be getting through a lot of those limitations as we go through this, these videos, which is, you know, there are a bum it's a bummer that this, there's limitations to this because, you know, it's too bad, right? If we want to identify a causal effect, we don't just have any easy outs. We can't always run an experiment. It's not plausible. Even when it is plausible, we might not be able to get enough people to make it worthwhile. Uh, we can't just control for everything because we might not be able to measure everything, or maybe we can't get people to, to believe our diagram. Uh, and then we have this other cool thing. We could find experiment kind of things in the real world, um, but there are some back jaws in that so a lot of sometimes this is just not that believable even when you can try to do it. Let me tell you what I mean. Uh, so we are trying to find some sort form of random variation in our treatment in the real world. Something that drives treatment. Doesn't necessarily have to be the only determinant of treatment, but something that contributes to whether you're treated or not that itself has no backdoors. It's sort of a source of random assignment. So like in the last video, we talked about the draft lottery, uh, where the random-ish date of your birth uh, was a strong driver of whether you went into the military because it was part of your draft order in the Vietnam War. Um, so that is a source of random variation in whether you happen to go into the military. Uh, and so does that work? Can we actually trust results that come from that sort of random variation? Because it's not actually random variation. We don't actually have a clean way of ensuring that that was done to the same sort of random standards that we would want something to be done. So I will say in general, if you're actually looking at something that's actually random, great. Like if it's, if it's random variation, if somebody out there happened to design a policy that was actually assigned randomly, which the Vietnam draft lottery very nearly is, you're probably good to go. But outside of that, we might want to use this same idea of finding exogenous sources of variation where things are not quite so clean. And that's where we sort of get into some gray area in terms of what we are willing to believe and what we are not uh, as we think about how to apply these methods. So let's, I'm going to talk about three different sort of levels of studies. I'm going to throw, show you three actual studies uh, that were done that use some sort of form of exogenous variation to identify the effect of a treatment on an outcome. And we can think about how believable we think these studies might be. And I think what we'll find is that these methods, this idea of isolating random variation in your treatment works as long as the assumption that it is indeed random, or at least that we are able to close all the back doors for that random variation, as long as that's believable. Do we believe that that is actually possible? And that is a contextual thing. You know, you have to know about the context to know whether there are alternate backdoor paths. We, we haven't really gotten rid of the requirement that we have to close all the backdoor paths. We've just moved that requirement. Instead of having to close all the backdoor paths from treatment to outcome, we now have to close all the backdoor paths from whatever we think is our form of random variation to the outcome, which hopefully is an easier task that we can more likely think that we actually know all the pathways and can actually measure all the things that are backdoors to shut them down. Or maybe there aren't any backdoors if it's actually random. So let's talk about the, some examples. So first, let's talk about this study. This study looked at the effect of winning the lottery on going bankrupt, right? There's sort of a story that we hear in the news sometimes. Oh yeah, you win the lottery, you spend big, and then suddenly you go bankrupt because you didn't know how to handle all the money. Is that something that actually happens? Uh, so we want to know the effect of winning the lottery on going bankrupt. Now, the problem is that people choose to play the lottery or not, and there might be a back door between simply being in the lottery uh, versus, and, and then their chances of going bankrupt as well. So we want something that uh, is some random variation controlling for the sort of person who plays the lottery. Well, uh, in this study, they compared different people, all of whom played the lottery, but some of whom won big pots and some of whom won little pots of money. Uh, and they tried to see whether the winning a big pot of money made you more likely to go bankrupt than not. The idea here is that within the group of people who play the lottery, it's basically random whether you win a lot or win a little, right? That's the idea. That's the source of random variation. And so you have to think, okay, it is basically random. If you have a lottery ticket, it is random whether you win a lot or a little of a little money, right? That is indeed a source of random variation. There should not be any backdoors from one from uh, from whether you, how much money you win to your chances of going bankrupt, except for the extent that the, the money itself is doing it, right? The actual treatment that you're interested in. So in this case, we might think that that is a pretty believable source of random variation. Now, again, if you just looked at winning the lottery versus not winning the lottery, 
that wouldn't work so well, right? Because again, people choose to play the lottery. Uh, and so there would be a backdoor from simply having a lottery ticket in the first place to winning. But once you know that somebody has already chosen to buy lottery tickets, well, in that group, winning or not, you could say is a good source of a random variation. And we have something that's sort of like an experiment. And what did they find? As we can see in this graph, they found that uh, immediately after winning, your chances of going bankrupt go down considerably if you win a big amount of money. Uh, however, they also found that if you wait a couple of years, uh, the chance of going bankrupt goes way up and it sort of all cancels out. So it doesn't really make you more or less likely to go bankrupt, but it does push your bankruptcy forward uh, further out into the future by a couple of years. So no big effect of winning the lottery there. Let's take one step further towards a randomization assumption or a source of exogenous variation that's maybe a slight bit less believable. So this one is, this study is looking at the effect of how polluted the air is on whether you choose to drive, right? You can imagine it's really smoggy out. You probably don't want to be walking. You probably don't want to be biking. You maybe don't even want to take the bus. You're going to be in your car so you can have the air conditioning running or whatever, so you don't have to breathe all that smog. Now this, of course, could be really bad because if more pollution makes you drive more and driving causes there to be more pollution, then that's a cycle you don't really want to be in. Uh, so it's important to know, does a smoggier air make you drive more? Now, obviously, you can't just randomize pollution. They can't randomly assign there to be more pollution on one day or another. Uh, and even if you like compare a really polluted city against a non-polluted city, maybe the polluted city is polluted because people just tended to drive more anyway. You can't make that comparison. But how about this? How about in the same city, let's say that you live in a city where the direction the wind happens to be blowing on a given day really affects how smoggy it is. So like in Beijing. In Beijing, when the wind is blowing in a particular direction, it blows pollution into the city. And when it's blowing in the other direction, it blows wind out of the city. And so the random-esque direction of the wind on a given day is going to determine how polluted it is. And if you can isolate just the part of pollution that's driven by the direction of the wind, then you sort of have a random assignment of pollution and you can see how that randomly assigned pollution affects driving. Now we have to ask ourselves, do we actually believe that the wind direction is random or are there some back doors? And if there are back doors, maybe we can close them. So you can imagine a couple things that might go wrong here. So uh, for example, maybe the wind direction tends to be related to the season. Maybe the wind tends to blow west more often in the spring and east more often in the fall. Uh, now that would be a back door. The season would drive both the wind direction uh, and possibly driving, right? Because people might be more like more or less likely to drive in different seasons. Now that is a back door. That would be something that would make our random assignment no longer work, but we can control for season. We can measure what season it is and control for it. So that's no problem. So then the question is, are there other sorts of things? Maybe the weather is related. Uh, you know, on a rainy day, maybe when it tends to rain more often when it's blowing west than when it's blowing east, and that would certainly affect your driving too. But again, maybe we can control for weather in the same way. So in this case, the wind direction, you know, we don't really have any control over it, but it's not entirely random. It is related to other things that might be related to our choice to drive. And the real question is, you know, can we control for those things? It might be easier to believe that we can control for the back doors from wind direction to driving than the, the back doors between pollution and driving because pollution is also related to things like are the factories running on a given day, right? There's a lot of other stuff going on there. It might be easier to deal with wind direction than with pollution. So I still think this is pretty believable. Uh, they did find that uh, when the wind is blowing pollution into the city, it makes people drive a little bit more, which makes sense. Uh, and I, I think that, that that random assignment assumption that they have, once they've controlled for things like the weather and the season, I think that's relatively believable. But again, we're in a bit more of a gray area. There's more of an assumption that we are relying on. All right, let's take an additional step back and look at another example of a kind of random assignment assumption that we can make that maybe requires even stronger assumption. And we can see sort of how far we're willing to carry this whole thing before we stop believing it. Because maybe you believe this next one, maybe you don't, right? It depends on context, what the, whether the assumptions we're making are true or not, and whether you can really justify those assumptions and support them. So uh, let's talk about uncompensated medical care. So this is an example of medical care that's provided by a hospital that the hospital never gets paid for. And you can imagine that might be a problem because if they're not getting paid for care, it's going to make it harder for them to provide really good care. They're going to lose money, all that sort of stuff. They might stop providing care. Uh, so how can we get random variation in uncompensated care? Well, uh, what this study from 2014 looked at is it looked at the Medicaid expansion. Medicaid is a way of funding health care in the United States, uh, and especially for the kind of people who might be likely to not pay their hospital bills or not be able to. Um, and uh, what this study looked at is it looked at uh, the expansion of this program. So uh, it says, okay, you know, everyone has Medicaid, uh, but uh, we have this expansion of the program in, in, in a, in a, at a certain period of time, so we can compare states sort of before and after that expansion. 
Um, and uh, what we're sort of saying here is that it is roughly random, you know, which states decided to expand. And if we can do that, we are sort of isolating the part of our of, um, of our funding that was driven by this change in policy. And then we can sort of say, okay, well, that's our random variation in funding. We're going to see how that affects our level of uncompensated care. Now, for this to work, we need to be willing to assume that it's basically random which states decided to expand Medicaid and which states did not. Keeping in mind that the decision to expand Medicaid or not was a very political one. And different kinds of governments might have made that decision in different ways. Uh, now, if we can control for the different kinds of governments that there are and the different decisions they make, like maybe we can control for the which political party happens to control that state at that time, maybe that's enough to restore the sort of random element of um, which states happen to expand Medicaid at the time. But again, we are sort of wading into, there's a longer list probably of backdoors that we need to account for to make it so that that Medicaid expansion was truly a random source of variation. Uh, and the, the, so we, we can always go further and further, right? We can always use muddier and muddier forms of random variation to drive our treatment. But the muddier it gets, the more work we have to do to really justify whether that is random or not. Uh, and that's what we are trying to do, right? It's the same thing we were trying to do with treatment. We're trying to close all the alternate pathways. Same thing here. We're trying to close all the alternate pathways from our random variation, which hopefully is easier, but we still have to do the same task. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we'll need to be thinking about, whether our source of exogenous variation is good enough as we get into methods that commonly use front door isolating techniques. Thank you. <laughs>